Rabbi Nachman Meuman Um, before I go ahead and start off tonight's class, I want to dedicate, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for a lot of different people that dedicated tonight's class. And first, we just want to say off of the general, tonight's class is in memory of Devorah, Fega, Bat, Shmuel, Zichono, Lebracha, and Menachem Mendel, Ben, Elchanan, Zichono, Lebracha, may both of their neshamas have an aliyah. Now, tonight's class is also dedicated from Sharon Arye, and this is dedicated to her husband, Hanania Elitsur, to be Zohe, to a less stressful way to make Parnasa an easy flow of prosperity. Amen. Yishut, the Torah we're learning tonight, she gave you a tremendous amount of, of uh, Shefa and Parnasa, and Hashem should give you everything you need, the Simcha and happiness. Um, also, I see here Miriam Bat Yosef, also dedicating tonight's class in memory of Deborah Feka Bachmuel. I'm also dedicating the class in honor of Miriam Bat Yosef that should find the shit up immediately before Rabbi Amena with a lot of simcha and happiness this year, tranquility and peace and everything that she needs. Um, also, I see here Mr. Ben Pianko. Thank you very much for de dedicating tonight's class. Hashem should bless you. First of all, you should find your shit up in Rabbi Amenu. She'll give you a tremendous amount of spiritual and physical shefa. Uh, Hashem, and you should be married Bezat Hashem, with your shidduch to find to see Mashiach being Rabbi Amenu immediately and should continue to grow, grow in Rabbeinu's path, grow in spirituality, and continue to get engrossed in this all these lessons of the Kutema Oram Bezat Hashem. Okay, so uh, for those that I see here that are also watching on Facebook, I want you to know that I can actually see your comments. So if you do have any questions, feel free to jump in through the comments section. I'm happy to answer them as we go. Same thing here with the people that are in Zoom. Go ahead and feel free to put your questions in the chat box. Okay, so let's get to work. Rabbeinu, uh, prolific chapter, chapter six, which deals a lot with the month of Elul, deals a lot with Teshuvah. So let's do a quick review catch up for those that were part last week and uh, for those that are uh, new this week, get you quickly caught up. So we start off the whole chapter talking about this concept of Kavod Elohim. What is Kavod Elohim? Rabbi Nachman is saying that a person has to increase Hashem's Kavod in the world. And in order to do that, what do you have to do? You have to forgo your own honor. That's called the concept of Kavod Elohim. The other kind of Kavod we spoke about was a Kavod Melachim. Kavod Melachim is the honor of kings. And that's essentially when a person is looking for his own honor, and he's actually searching for it. Now, we found Rabbeinu says that when a person is searching for honor, it's questionable, meaning that a people will start second-guessing you and judging you and really actually think, is this guy really worth getting this honor? While Kavod Elohim is something where you are doing it only for Hashem's honor, and it's not something that's questioned. You People will see that this guy is legit and he's real, and he's doing it just for that reason alone. Rabbeinu says, how do you get kavod elokim? How do you get this honor of Hashem? You do that through repentance, through teshuva. And what's the highest way, uh, Rabbeinu says, of teshuva? It's the concept of, so to speak, if somebody embarrasses you, right? By you not responding back, whether it's with your mouth, and even more so, imagine, with your heart, and you don't get angry at that person at all, that is called kavod elokim. You're staying quiet in the face of being embarrassed. Now, Rabbeinu says kavod, which starts with the letter chaf. Letter chaf represents another word with chaf, keter. Keter, which is the crown, which is the highest level of all the spherot. And the keter is synonymous with the word katar. Katar means waiting, right? And as we learned that in order for the process of teshuva, you have to wait. There has to be a lot of patience involved. Shura doesn't happen overnight. 
So we went from the chaf of kavod to the chaf of the keter to the concept of katar, which is the waiting. Now, Rabbeinu also spoke about this concept of the different type of names of Hashem. When a person is in that concept before teshuva, he's in the concept of the name of Hashem called ekye, which is I will be. Right, and, and we spoke about this concept that a person really hasn't been existing in the world at all until he's in that stage of I will be, right? And then we also spoke about how the Gemara says that's better if a person has more sins than mitzvot, it's better that a person hasn't even been born, aka he hasn't been living yet. He's not even in being mode. He's not in repentance mode. He's not in teshuva mode. That was the concept of ekiah. And then he spoke about the concept of the backyard, the back part, I should say, sorry, of Ekiah, of the name Ekiah, the back part, meaning when you're not in Ekiah mode, when you're not in that Teshuvah mode, so now Ekiah, so to speak, is facing behind. It's not looking at you. You're looking at the back part of Ekiah. So the back part of Ekiah, when we went into the concept of the Gematrias, and we learn a specific way of, lead, of reading the back part of Ekiah, if we said Aleph, and we read it with Gematria, Aleph, Right, olive hay, olive hay yud, and olive hay yud hay. You put them all together, it's the same gematria as the word dam. Now, dam means blood, which is red, right? And when a person is in that mode, when he's in a state of dam, it's basically the dam represents this concept of the yetzer hara, which is alive in him, the evil inclination, which is alive, which is in his heart which is located actually in the left area of your heart. That's what the Dham represents, which is the back part of Ekya, which means that your Dham, remember, Dham is what is Asaf. Asaf is red, right? So with that being said, then now we are now up to where we need to be. And let me now share our screen, and we're going to get to work here. Let me pop open here. One second. Okay. All right. And let me minimize this. Okay. So first of all, I uh, I want to say I want a big big thank you also to um, Safari. Safari is an incredible tool here for a lot of people, and uh, for me personally, I found it amazing that we have an opportunity here just to going through Safari and being able to get all your information out there. I would actually support Safaria if you can. I know right now they're doing also a campaign and it's a beautiful, beautiful website. You have every single source of tour available. There is a plug. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm just telling you because it's amazing what they do and uh, really call up a vote to them for providing all these tour works here. Okay. So now let's put you guys right where we left off last week. And by the way, I hope and pray that most people here have not gone through the embarrassment of this month. People have been experiencing it, but I had to get it out there from beforehand because you never know. And if you're in that mode, now you can feel a little bit better about what's going on. You know that this is going to be for your best. All right. We were up to here. Okay. So now Rabbi Nachman continues and he says like this. Vitikun laze. Now, the rectification for this, meaning we have this concept of the blood, right? We spoke about the concept of the embarrassment, right? And what's the concept of the embarrassment, right? When a person now is embarrassed, what usually happens? Your blood, so to speak, comes to your face and you turn red. And by you turning red, this is the concept now of and, and by you not responding, remember we spoke about the concept of dam le dom, and now we're, this is exactly where we're at right now. V'tikun laze, another rectification for this, sheyafoch dam le dom, to turn the dam, the blood, to dom. Same letters, same words, you can see that here, and it means blood to quiet. Okay? Sheihi emina shomim hirpatam ve'ena meshivim. He should be among those who hear themselves being ridiculed. And what happens? You should not respond regarding to your honor. Right? You're getting embarrassed. Don't respond. And not just even that. 
Don't but even be like, so to speak, feeling anything in your heart like we spoke about. Right? Why? Because at the end of the day, we're trying to go for this concept of kavod elokim. Right? There's a lot of stake here. We want to right now, so to speak, honor Hashem. So you're staying quiet and you're minimizing your own self-importance. Right? Your honor has gone down. And by you doing that, this is a concept of repentance before Hashem. Hashem. For when he fulfills this concept of being quiet before God, as Hakadosh Baruch Hu Mapilo Halalim Halalim, then the Holy One strikes his enemies dead. Moshe Katuv, as it brings in a pasuk in Tehillim, and it says, Dom la Hashem vehit Halalo Hu Yapil Lecha Halalim. So the pasuk says, Be Dom, Dom, right? Be quiet before God and Hit cholel, hope longingly for him. So we see in this Pasuk in Tehillim, Rashi says something interesting. He says, he's going to bring you two explanations of this concept of the word dome, which means quiet. One of them is the concept of you have to be wait, you have to wait patiently for God's salvation and being quiet while waiting that salvation. That's one concept. But basically, a person has to be quiet and silent and endure the embarrassment in order to do teshuva, in order to repent. And you also have to be patient. And that's this concept of the keter, which was the katar, the waiting to fully repent. And that's, and how do we, where does it come from? Because if you look at the pasuk, it says here, vechit holel, right here, vechit holel, right here, you see it right there. Bechit holel means to hope longingly for him. And this idea of hope longingly for him is this concept of waiting. So Rabbi Nachman just brought you a beautiful pasuk to prove this concept, this idea. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, Kainu velibi halal bekibi, another very famous pasuk from Tehillim, which means, and my heart is hollowed within me. What does that have anything to do with it? First of all, the Pasuk originally says, God will strike them. If you look at the Pasuk right here, it says, So the concept of halalim in Masachet Gitin, which is where it comes from, the Talmud teaches that when a person is beset by enemies and he finds it, finds it impossible to withstand them, the best thing he can do is be quiet before God. And that is by praying to God and patiently waiting for his salvation, he will eventually prevail over his enemies. So this pasuk right here that, that we see from Tehillim, be quiet before God and hope longly for him. God will strike them, the dead, the halalim. We wait for Hashem for his salvation. Be quiet, do not respond, and let Hashem take over. And then the, the second part, which says, and my, from another part of Tehillim says, and my heart is hollowed within me. That's uh, David Amel. David Amel says in the beginning of that pasuk, I'm impoverished and I'm poor. So King David said this, declaring that he had successfully de defeated his evil inclination. And that really means that King David had minimized his own honor. And he was impoverished. He was poor, right? Obviously, a king is rich. He was poor. He was impoverished. And he was therefore, he was able to master this concept of the evil inclination. My heart is hollowed within me meaning I destroyed my evil and inclination. That's the concept of cholel, longingly waiting, teshuva, repentance, destroying your evil inclination. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, And then through this concept of being quiet and silence, what happens? This bad blood that's on the left hollow, which is where the evil inclination is, it's lessened. It goes down. And here it's saying, the defeated enemy, which we spoke about, was the evil inclination, which is in the blood, which is in the left side of the heart. And, 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 and all that's there, right? The head and face of Ekya, the back part of Ekya, which means to be repentance. When a person is enduring the silence in the face of embarrassment, when he's patiently waiting the salvation, and it's hard, and you're suffering, 
This suffering reduces and weakens this potency and the strength of the blood in the left part of the heart. And by you doing that, you are, so to speak, getting rid of the evil inclination, guys. That's called teshuva. It's gonna now. What happens when you get rid of the when you get rid of that? Now you can do proper teshuva. Now your mind comes into play. Now you can move forward. But it's an incredible idea and a concept for this because most people don't think about it. Now, what does that mean? It means the next time you're again you're caught in a situation where you feel like you're being embarrassed, being put down. You should know. Don't respond. Stay quiet. And don't even be angry at that person. Remember, it's coming from Hashem. We spoke about this last week. Everything comes from Hashem, even the insult that's coming your way. And this is a very hard lesson. And I'm not taking away from, again, I always say this is not easy to do. But this is Rabbi Nachman in full colors telling you what you need to do. So now Rabbi Nachman continues and he says like this. And this is an aspect of slaughtering the evil inclination. Through which he merits kavod elokim. Moshekatuv is another pasuk in that says, "Zoveach toda yechab daneni." Whoever brings a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. So this concept. Look at the pasuk. Whoever brings a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. So what is this sacrifice of thanksgiving? Which is, in, in Hebrew, we call it a korban toda, right? Toda, which actually comes from the word hodaya. Hodaya actually means confession, admission. Rashi brings down and explains that that means actually a person who confesses and repents, who honors God. So look at the Pasuk again. Amazing. Look what it says. Hashem is saying, whoever brings a sacrifice of thanksgiving, whoever is bringing a sacrifice, you're, so to speak, getting rid, you're sacrificing your heart, your blood, the blood of the animal is the sacrifice, right? Your blood being sacrificed. Repentance. That's what the Hodaya is. Honors me. That's the Kavod Elohim we're talking about here. Beautiful. And then continues, and he says, "Vidarshu hakomenu zikhonol lebracha al zebichat ayetzahara." So the sages explain, based on this pasuk, that this refers to the concept of the slaughtering of the evil inclination. That's this concept, which I was mentioning. When it says, when a person is remaining quiet through being insulted, his silence for the Hashem, for his, for Hashem's sake. He reduces the power of the blood in the left hollow of his heart, weakening and slaughtering of the evil inclination. And that's considered true glorification in our Hashem. So now we've shown through all this the connection between quiet, dom, silence, which is a concept of teshuva, of repentance, which is an admission of guilt and the confession of sin, which is the kavod elokim, which is what we're going through right now during the month of Elul, right before Rosh Hashanah, that we actually are confessing our sins as we do every single day. Now we're going to jump into that idea right now. So now we start off number three. A person needs to constantly embrace the attribute of repentance. So here, interestingly enough, it says the value, the great value of teshuva repentance and the power to slaughter this evil inclination, a person might make this effort to remain quiet and silent in the face of embarrassment. And then you assume, ah, that's it. Fine. I'm embarrassed. I did it. Baruch Hashem. I did teshuva. No. Rabbi Nachman's telling you another big chiddush that he says, and he talks about this concept of a person should constantly, constantly embrace this attribute of teshuva of repentance. Rabbi Nasson of Breslev says, based on this, that the concept of teshuva, it exists at every single level. And a person always has to begin with his devotions to Hashem 
with a fresh attitude every single day. Every day you start your devotions anew and you prepare yourself to be in that stage of ekye, that stage of teshuva, the stage of repentance. Because even someone who has already merited such a lofty level in serving Hashem, you have to see yourself, you're constantly in this mode of ekye. You're not at Havaya. Remember, we spoke about the other name of Havaya, which is like the ultimate, the high. That's where we like want to be. That's our, you know, our destination, the other name of Hashem. Every day we are in Teshuvah mode. It's not like I did it once and I'm done. Every single day. Rabbi Nachman says on this, and he says, Kimi Omar, who, for who can say, Zikiti Libi Taharti Mehatati? I've cleansed my heart. I am purged of my sin. That's a Pasuk in Proverbs. I've cleansed my heart. I'm purged of my sin. That's it. I did my teshuva. I'm done. No. Because Rabbi Nachman says, Ki besha'ash adam omer. Because even at the moment that a person says, as we do every single day, chatati, aviti, pashati, which means I've sinned, I transgressed, I've acted wantonly. These are the things that we say in Tachanun every single day. Which means it's impossible for him to say this with a pure heart and without an ulterior motive. What does that mean? So this is a new chiddush, but it's not really a chiddush. It's, it's something that the more we think about it, Rabbi Nachman is right in what he's about to say. So the simple meaning of the verse, first of all, that said, I've cleansed my heart, I am purged of sin, means a person has to constantly recognize the all-encompassing nature of God's awareness. And therefore, you cannot deny the sins before Hashem. And nobody truly can actually claim to have totally cleansed yourself and fully repented for that sin. So Rabbi Nachman here is adding a brand new dimension to this idea, and he's showing you that even in the very confession, the fact that I'm saying, Chatati, Aviti, Pashati, right? It's not really 100% Teshuvah. You're not really doing that sincerely with honesty, right? And you can give examples. I mean, from anywhere from, a, let's say, a, a whatever age you are, let's say you're in front of your father, a young kid or a teen or whatever, and he's like, oh, they're looking at me. He's My father's looking at me. Oh, I'm going to patati, pashati. You're not really meaning it. You're just doing it. You're going through the motions. Or what about in general if you're in front of a crowd, right, and people know who you are, I'm just saying, and you're going through the motions. Are you really going through the motions? Are you really doing this for Hashem? Or are you doing it as another level for yourself? Because sometimes – People will be like, oh, I, I want to confess my sins because I don't, don't want to get punished in Olam Haba. I want to receive reward in Olam Haba. I want to be like everybody else. It's not sincere. It's not truth. I don't really, really, really feel bad for what I did. Rabbi Nachman's, you know, going into the, so to speak, the truth of how many people are inside. Just because I'm going through the motions doesn't mean I really feel that. Rabbi Nassan, he just, you know, just to clarify, he says, he says, and you can see here in the problem, Vizehu, he says, Vizehu mi Yomar, this is the meaning of Zikiti Libi Taharti Mechatati. Who can say I've cleansed my heart? I'm purging my sin. Hainu mi Yuchalomar. In other words, who can say, that his heart is sincere and pure of ul ulterior motives? Afilu Beshaashe Omer. And even at the time he's saying, Hatati, I've sinned. Mi Yomar. Meaning, he's saying, I'm purging my sin. I'm sorry. He's saying, this is the meaning of who can say I'm purged of my sin. It means that he's purged of this concept of sinning. I've transgressed. I have acted wantonly, which he utters. For even then, his confession is not completely sincere and pure without ulterior motives. Rabbi Nassim is just basically kind of re-explaining again what Rabbi Nachman just said. With this idea of ulterior motives, it's a question for all of us. When we do repentance and we do teshuva, Rosh Hashanah, how many times are we going to say, 
uh, for the Ashkenazic, you know, right? We do all these things and we start confessing. Do we mean it? Guys, do we mean it? And that's something that we're going to all have to reflect on for the next coming days, obviously, for the month of Elul, heading into Rosh Hashanah, 10 days of repentance, of course, Yom Kippur, Day of Forgiveness. We have to really, really dig deep, guys. And remember, Rabbi Nachman has talked about this before, the concept of crying before Hashem, really feeling bad for what you did, right? And that's something that, how true is it? How real are your motives? That's what Rabbi Nachman is trying to dig in deep here to that concept. So now Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, Nimtza Shetzarik Lasot Shuva Al Teshuva Harishona. Ah, we find therefore that he must repent for his first act of repentance, Teshuva Al Teshuva, Chaynu Al Chatati Aviti Pashati. For the I have sinned, I have transgressed, I have acted wantonly that he said. Meaning, you have to purify your previously impure confession right remember we spoke about beforehand when Hashem answers Moshe Rabbeinu and he Moshe asks him the question what's your name what should I tell the Jewish people remember he was in the in the burning bush and all that and he and he says what, what do I and so Hashem calls Akia is my name right Akia Asher Akia that's what he said I be I will be who I will be right so Rab Nasan writes that's why God's answer to Moshe was not just ekye, but look at this, guys. Remember, ekye means teshuva. He says, ekye, asher, ekye, meaning God was alluding to the fact that in order to ekye means repentance, a person must always begin anew and over and over again by repenting for his earlier act of repentance. Teshuva al teshuva, teshuva. Ekye, asher, ekye. You have to constantly do teshuva over your teshuva. And that's the true way to repent, Rav Nassim says, based upon Rabbi Nachman. Now, I'm going to tell you all something very personal, but it's a perfect example. Hashem presented me with an opportunity, Baruch Hashem, this year. And, um, you know, nothing comes by, by chance. And I'll tell you, look, I've done, I started the path of teshuva. We spoke about this at the end of last class privately with all the group here. We start, I started on my path of teshuva uh, now about almost 14 years ago, almost 15, 15 years ago, right? And Baruch Hashem, thank God, you know, done my thing. I've done my past. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can to move forward, grow, right? That's, that's everyone's goal in life, right? About a week ago, I heard in my class, I was in my class, sorry, I heard in my davening, usually they have two halachas for the day. And the rabbi said something that blew me away. He said... That, and by the way, you guys are going to hear this and you're going to have now start having double and triple thoughts about what I'm going to tell you because I'm sure everybody or a lot of people have this issue. He says that when a person has past life, let's call it memorabilia, with them and it stays with them, those potentially can become malachim, accusing angels for that person. For, for example, when a person has pictures. So back in the day, I have pictures of, a per I'm not saying myself right now, I'm just saying in general, a person has pictures of their life, what they used to be like, right? And whether it was doing co incorrect things that Hashem does not like in immoral, immoral life, whether it's a picture of, let's say from a man's perspective, um, with women uh, in clubs, I don't know, for example, or... Uh, here I am eating shrimp at a restaurant or look at this cheeseburger or this is me at a football game on Shabbat, attending a football game on Shabbat. These are real things and these are accusing angels that we are just leaving behind just sitting there waiting to accuse us in Shammai. As I'm reading this concept of Teshuvah, Teshuvah and I'm hearing this message from Hashem I go, oh my gosh, this is a, again, this is a personal thing, but I want to apply this concept of the teshuva, teshuva, so you guys can see what I'm talking about on a very high level, right? I see myself in a situation where I realized I have all these albums that are sitting with dust in my house that I never looked at, 
No, I never ever go back to, but they're there for my youth. Ha ha ha. When I was going, on, let me go back and reminisce how I was, you know, 10 years ago. Look at me, how I was young, etc. But that was my, you know, let's say going back more than 15 years ago, college, etc. That was my old life. And my old life technically was not the life that Hashem wanted me to live. So there's a lot of pictures there that are not pictures that not only are me to be proud of, but I wouldn't even want my children to eventually look at these pictures. So what did I have to do? I did something that, believe it or not, actually seemed kind of difficult and it was hard to an extent. I literally took all my pictures. I took out every single bad picture that represented all these different things that I just mentioned to you. I put them in a garbage and I threw them outside my house. And that was the end of that. I kept all the pictures that dealt with just me you know, with a guy or, or me by myself or me looking, you know, let's call it sober. <laughs> but everything else that dealt with a life that, that does not live contrary to the life of a from Jew, a God-fearing Jew, I threw out. And in the beginning, the process was not easy because it's your past life. And you know, I want to look back what it used to look like before or what happened then. But the reality is, do I really want to reminisce on this? Is this really what God wants from me? No, I'm a new person. This is called, remember, I did Teshuvah, so to speak, a long time ago. This is Teshuvah al Teshuvah for me. But think about for all of us, whether you're watching this here right now on Zoom or on Facebook, whether you're going to watch this later on at home, whether it's now or in a year from now, what an incredible chidush. Do we want these pictures? Why is it important that we need to relive this pure previous life of ours? It's hard. And once you let go of it, you're telling Hashem, look, Hashem, I'm not that person anymore. That's not who I am. I want to be close to you. This is not me. Because in Olam Haba, you think they're going to be like, oh, congratulations. That's a picture of you in a club. You know, like, no, that's not what they want. They're not going to be happy about that. So this is a beautiful example of doing that. And Baruch Hashem, I'm just grateful to God that you got to pick up on the messages that you hear and run with them. And obviously in the month of Elul, which is the time for Teshuah and repentance, it's something that we can do. So with that being said, everyone's not going to be like, oh, great, now I have to throw away all my pictures. Okay. Um, <laughs> so then now continue Rabbi Nachman, and he says like this. Ve'afilu im yodea adam be'atim. And even if a person knows inside himself that he has been totally sincere in his repentance. You have to still repent for his first act of repentance. You got to do it again and again. Why? And this is because when he first repented, he did so according to his level of perception then. But afterwards, when he again repents, he certainly recognizes and he perceives even more about God. So that that relative to his present perception, his first perception was certainly not as good as the first one in comparison. We'd find, therefore, that he must repent for his original repentance. For having made crass the exalted nature of his godliness. So let's understand a little bit about this. Because this is very, very fascinating, right? A person does teshuva, he's at one stage, he starts learning more Torah, he does more mitzvot, he starts growing. What, there's a difference between teshuva year one, God willing, and teshuva year three, and year five, and year nine, and year 15. You've grown. Every time you grow on that level, you look back on that sin potentially that you did, and you realize... I mean, if you're on the right path and you're going up, you need to be doing teshuva again over that sin 
Because now you're a much higher individual in regards to your perception and godliness and awareness of Hashem, right? As we're growing, Baruch Hashem, I, I hope that's the path for everybody. But that's what Rabbi Nachman's saying here. That every single time you grow, you got to go back and go, wow, that sin that I did. Now, you're going to go back to every single sin? No, but if a person takes the time to think about the big ones or anything that pops in your mind that you know that stands out and you've grown, wow, I can't believe it. Hashem, I'm so sorry. Because now you're smarter. You have more intellect. You have more dot, and you realize the severity of that sin. Which is a very amazing concept. And it's something that I know that for me personally, myself, as I've been uh, dealing with the month of Elul, I'm thinking about this constantly. Now. I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back. I'm going back more than I've ever gone back before. And, and really trying to realize the severity of how much I've done. And I remember, it's not about because of because of me, because because I want Alam Haba. No, it's because you have a relationship with God and you want to keep that relationship so good that you don't realize the more you go closer to him, the more you feel bad for how you were beforehand, even if you've changed. That's called Teshuvah Teshuvah. Rabbi Nachman's telling you and Rabbi Nassim's saying it every single day you got to be like that, which means every single day you're growing. Yeah. So now just a little bit on, on some of the commentary here, which is, I think, very important to go through. So everybody, no, Rab Nassan is explaining, right, this concept that really there's three levels of teshuva. The very first time a person repents, what happens? He slaughters that evil inclination on that level. That's the first one. Yet as we've seen he has to still try to repent purely and without ulterior motives. So the first one is, Hashem, I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. Whether it's the embarrassment coming at you, whatever that is, right? I'm so sorry, Hashem. Then the second one is, I have to do it again. We have to do a repentance over the Hatati Abiti Pashati, meaning, did I really do it sincerely? That's level number two. And then after that, first repentance, then we have the third level, which is the teshuva of the teshuva, starting anew until he can repent with absolute sincerity. And by that, by doing this, a person is going from one cycle of ekye to havaya, which we remember we spoke of the, the higher level of Hashem's name. And there's a constant, constant concept of this. And you're constantly looking to repent completely. But at the end, why? To purify your heart to purify the actual confession that you made because you want to make sure that your teshuva is legit and it's sincere. And that's the way, the true way of really having this concept of complete teshuva for your sins. Now, Rav Nassim brings that again back to the story, which we like to spoke, we spoke about last week about the Jewish people in the time of Mitzrayim. Let's look at it again. Let's talk about this concept of teshuva, the three times of ekye, and how that relates to the Jewish people in the, in, in the times of Egypt. In the beginning as a nation, the Israelites were told to enter the state of ekye. They were entered the state of teshuva. Right? They have to prepare themselves to being, to being. Fine. They achieved that first level of repentance. And then they would have to repent again in order to acquire a sincere, purified motive, free of external considerations. Once they did that second level of repentance, and that was accomplished, right? Then they have to do, and what, what happens when you do that? Then they started getting these larger, more, uh, larger perceptions of godliness, which is what happened. And, and when they did that, they were finally able, able to get this concept of this true repentance. So here Rav Nassim says, no matter how many obstacles stood in their way, as long as they were prepared to constantly go through the stages of Ekya, the Israelites would eventually be able to eliminate, eliminate their impurities, conquer their material desires, and achieve their objective. What was the objective? The objective was the exodus, to leave Egypt. And that's why it says the, the word Ekya, if we look at the Pasuk in Exodus, Pasuk 3, 4, chapter 3 in Pasuk 14. It has the name Ekyeh three times. Why three times? For the three times that we just spoke about. 
The first one is, again, to repeat, is just the general confession. The second one is doing a sincere confession. And the third one is teshuva, al teshuva. That's the concept of the three teshuvas. So Rabbi Nachman continues, he says, V'zebechinat olam haba. And this is an aspect of the world to come. The Arizal explains that the name Olam Haba, we know Olam Haba is the world to come, literally means the world Haba that is coming. That is, it's in a constant state of coming, always bringing with it new mentalities and revelations of godliness. In this case, Rabbi Nachman is taking that idea of Olam Haba, this constant revelations of godliness, Right, And that's the idea of referring to this newer and greater perceptions of godliness that we attain after each teshuva. The teshuva that I just did, for example, as an example, with my pictures, I have much more Baruch Hashem, thank you Hashem, more godliness, more awareness. And therefore, that's the idea of Alam Haba. We are now, every time you're Alam Haba, it's a constant awareness of Hashem. Greater perceptions are being thrown at you in Alam Haba. It's constantly coming at you. And we know the Shabbat, which it says, which will be completely Shabbat, right? We know the Gemara teaches that this world was created to last for 6,000 years, which corresponds to the six days of creation, which are the six days of the week. The seventh millennia, which is the world to come, is likened to the seventh day to Shabbat. So Shabbat is the seventh day, the seventh millennia, which is considered this concept of, all of the world to come. That's why he's comparing Shabbat to world to come. And then he says, ah, Haino kulo teshuva. So Shabbat, which is really completely teshuva, as it's written, for Shekatuv, so it says here, the Pasuk means, then Shavta, Shavta means Shabbat. Shabbat means you will return to God, your Lord. He took a Pasuk from Deuteronomy. And now let's understand what this is all about. So he says like this, the word Shavta, which is really spelled Shabbat, right? It means, Shabbat means to return. And in this minute, we're talking about the concept of returning to God. Look at the Pasuk. The Shavta ad Hashem Elokecha. You will return to God, your Lord. Shabbat has the same letters as Shavta. And this indicates the Shabbat and Teshuva, which is repentance, are one concept. That's why Shabbat is the best time to do Teshuva. Because there's no obstacles in your way. It's the most opportune time, right? If we're supposedly keeping Shabbat. You're learning Torah, which is the highest level, trying to do teshuva, which is giving you God, God awareness, is making you a God-fearing person, right? It's giving you consciousness, awareness of Hashem. Shabbat is the best time for that, but that's why Shabbat is known as the true place, the true day of true teshuva. And that can be understood in light of the Shabbat being the aspect of the same aspect of the world to come, which is the ultimate good, which is the place where all separation and limitation disappear, and creation, everything is one unity. Everything will be one and totally good. On Shabbat, we have to feel. It's, a, it's, a, it's known. Shabbat is a taste of Alam Haba. So it says that, that the Shabbat is a taste of it. In the world to come, Alam Haba is also this concept, which is a place of forgiveness of sin. Because once you've gone through all the ringers, if a person makes it to Alam Haba, straight, you're a tzaddik, amazing. People have to go through different things. Some people have to go through Gehenna. Some people have to go through different things. But once you're in Alam Haba, that's the place of forgiveness of sin. So Shabbat, the concept of teshuva, which is connected to the world to come, is all about repentance. Our sages taught and they said, whoever delights in the Shabbat, will be granted boundless prosperity. 
And what's going to happen? It says in Masachah Shabbat, and you're going to have your sins forgiven. Shabbat has that concept of getting rid of your sins. Because when one keeps Shabbat, it brings one to the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth, emet, which is really one, which is this concept of the oneness. There's no separation. There's no limitation. And what happens in this kind of forum, forgiveness is the supreme. It's the max. That's what happens. And that's why Rav Nassim says something amazing about Shabbat. It's a very well-known thing. In, in Masechet Shabbat, it says, were the Jews to twice, two times, keep all the laws of Shabbat, they would be redeemed immediately. Why? You ready for this? Rav Nassim is amazing. I'm going to repeat it one more time because this is where we're very well known. You want Mashiach to come? Guys, I'm sure you know. You want Mashiach to come? The Jewish people have to keep, all the Jewish people have to keep the Shabbat two weeks in a row. Mashiach is here. Rav Nassim says on that, this is amazing. If Shabbat represents Teshuva, therefore the two Shabbat that the Jewish people have to keep, that corresponds to Teshuva, Al Teshuva. See that? How amazing that is? Rav Nassim takes a beautiful idea and he brings it home to this lesson. Teshuva al Teshuva. You keep two Shabbats, Mashiach's coming. Amazing. We're going to be done with the class in about 10 minutes or a little bit less. So now Rabbi Nachman says, Ki ikar lam habahu asagalu kato kumoshekatu so he says, for the essence of the world to come will be the ability to have a perception, a perception of his godliness, as it's written in the book of Yirmiyahu in the book of Jeremiah. They will know me from the least of them to the greatest. What is this pastor talking about in Yirmiyahu? That they're going to know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Yirmiyahu concludes in that passage that he's talking about. It says, for I will forgive their iniquities and disregard their sins. In our context, Rabbi Nachman is quoting this verse as a proof text that because the Jews will merit teshuva, al teshuva, in the world to come, God is going to forgive their iniquities and they will come to know God through their greater perceptions. Thus the world to come suggests attaining ever greater perceptions of godliness. And as the Rabbi Nachman teaches in our lesson, this could be accomplished even now in the present in this world through Teshuvah. And in fact, the verse alludes to this when it says, from the least to the greatest. What does that mean? This translates as ascending in one's recognition of God from the least, what's the least? From the lower perceptions of Hashem, when we're just starting out, to recognize Him through the loftier perceptions, the higher perceptions, the greatest. That's why the Pasuk says, they will know me from the least of them to the greatest, from the bottom perception of Hashem to the greatest perception of Hashem. And that's when you're gonna, and that's why the Pasuk continued and it said, for I will forgive their iniquities and disregard their sins. The more you know Hashem, the more you do teshuva, I will get rid of their sins. Beautiful. Therefore, each time what happens, he comes to a deeper perception, and it's going to be necessary to repent for the preceding perception. So now we have a lot of commentaries to discuss about this. But just to tie everything all together, and we're thinking... This probably will be a good place to end and to stop. Let's see here. Here he goes like this. In order to merit the new and ever greater revelations of godliness in the world to come, right? A person has to repent, right? We spoke about for his earlier, more mundane perceptions of godliness. Year one, I knew Hashem this way. Year five, oh, I grew. I knew him this way. Okay. So we're constantly doing teshuva over our sins for what we did in the past. Because we're now more conscious of Hashem. And we feel worse about we that we understand the severity of the sin on a much higher conscious, consciousness level. Now, Rab Nassim Abrasov says, and he explains this concept with the Teshuva, and he says it's impossible to attain, to attain true repentance 
without first being tested. The Baal Shem Tov taught, a person's first motivation towards repentance is sent to him by God. God sometimes instills in you that first idea of I'm going to do Teshuvah. And when God does that, that's an ascent for that person. That means he's about to go up now, so to speak. And he's given a taste of a level he personally has not yet achieved yet. If you ever find people, especially when you're just starting out in the path of repentance and teshuva, you're on fire, right? You're like, oh my God, this is like the best thing in the whole world. Oh my God, Shabbat and this mitzvah and that. You're so excited about everything. Hashem gives you a gift. He gives you that excitement in the beginning. And I know for those that have started to keep started to do Teshuvah or observe it now, you guys all know what we're talking about. In the beginning, it's the best. Everything's amazing. But then he is tested. And more often than not, what happens? He finds himself backsliding and he commits sins and he messes up. And this is called a descent, right? But really which is going to be something we're going to talk about probably the next class is this concept that even though you're going down, the purpose of your descent that you're going down from your super high level of being close to God, it's really to produce a higher level of going up closer to Hashem. The reason a person is tested is to see whether he's capable and willing to strengthen himself against the onslaught of his evil inclination. Hashem wants to see how you're going to be with, with that evil inclination is testing you constantly. And if he is and he does, then every step he takes towards further spirituality, especially those that require great effort, that's an aspect of teshuva al teshuva. Ah, that's a beautiful idea here, guys. So we're saying you're on fire. You start on fire and then things happen and, oh, okay, it's not as exciting anymore. And then you move backwards and you go down and you're sinning and the evil connection is beating you up. But then you try to make a comeback and then you're like, no, and I got to learn Torah and I got to. So this down, it's okay. It's fine. It's normal because God wants you to go a level higher. In order for you to go higher spiritually, guess what happens? You need to go down. That's a concept we're going to about to learn very soon. It's an integral part of this whole chapter, Rabbi Nachman's lesson. How to go up, how to go down, how does that tie in with the, the month of Elul? But therefore, this is the idea of teshuva al teshuva. And now, by you going down and come up, you're now closer to Hashem. You came closer to Him. And you achieved the level He had previously tasted, but this time you earned it. He didn't give it to you for free. In the beginning, the beginning God gave you, you're on fire. You went down, now you're back up, and now you're back at that same place. Yeah, now I'm on fire. Now I'm feeling close to Hashem. Now I'm feeling really good about my Yiddish kind. I'm feeling close about my service to Hashem. And it says here that these tests that a person must pass on, he has a new level of spirit, spiritual advancement. And that's this concept Rabbi Nachman spoke about, the idea of Keter, Qatar. You have to wait. You have to have patience. Because before accomplishing this level of teshuva al teshuva, of going down to go back up, you have to wait. There's a patience process here. It's not going to happen overnight. And by you waiting, what's going to be waiting? You're going to be tested. That's part of the waiting, the tests that come your way. And this is where you see his desire. And you're going to see whether he's going to have resolve to repent and get through all these obstacles. And if he remains determined, his determination will lead him to constant repentance, to shuva, al to shuva. Amazing. And I think right now, I think this is a good place to stop. And I think we learned a lot, a lot of things right now. But one of the things, if we can just take this idea, and again, we're going to be going through the lesson, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts. But what we can learn from today's lesson is we spoke about last week embarrassment. Okay, Kavod Elokim. Okay, that's fine. We're gonna take it. We're gonna take it. We're not gonna. We're not gonna respond. Fine. But this week, we have to understand, especially now heading into Rosh Hashanah, how many times are we gonna say Khatati, Aviti, Pashati, right? For those that have not repented, 
now is a good time to start your first repentance. I'm so sorry, Hashem. I want to start like new. I want to be a better person. I know that I did this sin. That's level one. Level two, are you saying it sincerely? Is it coming from really from truth? What is your reasoning why you're doing it? Are you doing it because you don't want to get punished? Are you doing it because you're seeing other people watching you? What is the reason why you're doing it? Is it because you truly want to be close to Hashem? Nah. So now this is what we need to analyze. Okay? And that's what part two is. And part three of this whole process is the concept of the Teshuvah, Teshuvah. I've given you already several examples. But most importantly, every day we have to do Teshuvah. If Baruch Hashem, we're growing constantly. For those that are watching this for the first time and, and learning about Rabbi Nachman, and if it's not your first time, it's also okay. But the idea, whether I'm year one, year five, year 15, year 25, 35, I've been 50 years observant. Where are you in regards to your teshuva process? How bad do you feel about what you did 40 years ago? Did it really affect you? Now that you're much more godliness is inside of you, you're much more aware of Hashem. You've grown so much. This is the third level. This is a high level, but this is Rabbi Nachman's. I told you before, and I'll say it again. He will not short sell you, okay? He's going to make you try to do the teshuva on the highest level because Bezrat Hashem, after 120 years, when we get to Olam Haba, you better believe that we've done teshuva because we understand this concept of teshuva, teshuva. And we understand what it means that we've gotten more aware of Hashem. That's what Rabbi Nachman's bringing home with beautiful insights from Rabbi Nassim of Breslov and Bezrat Hashem. I bless everybody that's out there today, whether you're here in the Zoom group today, whether you're at home watching through Facebook or through YouTube later on in the replays. Um, I just wish all of you, Zat Hashem, you should be matzliach, should be successful. And number one, your teshuva, that you should try your best to really hunker down. And really, when you're looking at all the different things that we say, that when we say, Khatati, I sinned. I'm sorry. And we go through all of them. I think Bezrat Hashem, if I have time tomorrow, I'm going to release a video on Facebook. I would love to go through every single one that we go like this, Hatati, Aviti, Pashati. What does it mean? What are you really saying? And that's so important because we say that nonstop throughout all the high holidays. We're constantly saying we're sorry for this or that. Don't you really want to know what it means just by saying, oh, I did this. Okay. No. We should look at the details of what every sin you did and analyze it and think about it and reflect on it. And it's day one Rosh Hashanah. And it's day two of Rosh Hashanah. And by the way, guys, look how amazing this is. You can't make this stuff up, right? Guys, Rosh Hashanah falls this year on Shabbat. Shabbat is the concept of teshuva, the concept of repentance, the concept of Olam Haba, of the world to come, of greater perceptions of Hashem which means this year of all years, we have an opportunity to really dig deep, to really have God consciousness on the highest of levels. Maybe because this year, Bezat Hashem, Mashiach is going to come. And we have to be ready to dig deep and have a crazy awareness of Hashem. And I have news for most people here. Uh, Hashem's, uh, uh, I would say Hashem's presence in the world has risen, obviously, through the virus has been here. And more people have now become more spiritual and more closer to Hashem. And it only makes sense that Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, the time of the world to come, the idea of teshuva and repentance. Guys, we need to bring this home. We need to bring this home. We have to do every possible effort to get close to Hashem. And Bezrat uh, Hashem, um, we should all be matzliach. I want to bless all of you that Hashem should bless you with a good, good year. We have to have very positive thoughts. Rabbi Nachman talks about this constantly. Rosh Hashanah is a time that we have to think positively, positively, that we're going to have an amazing, amazing year. And think good thoughts. And with those good thoughts, that Hashem is going to provide for us and give us everything we need spiritually and materially, and that we're going to constantly grow in His service. And on top of all that, we also have to, and we have to be joyous. You have to be happy. You cannot get angry. You cannot get angry on Rosh Hashanah. This is a big test for a lot of people. You can't get angry. And of course, the concept of not speaking, try not to speak much, re recite Tehillim's, Learn Torah, pray to Hashem, heed for the dude, don't sleep the first day. It's also important. It's a big custom. Don't sleep on the first day of Rosh Hashanah because it's saying like you sleep, it's like a sleepy year. You want to ask Hashem 
to be as close to him as possible, to forgive you for your sins. And at the same time that a person needs to be joyous on Rosh Hashanah, a person also, as Rabbi Nachman says, it's important to cry. Cry. Cry for teshuva because you've made sins to separate yourself from Hashem, because you want to get close to him. Right? Which is a very, I mean, I mean a lot of people find that during specific parts of Rosh Hashanah and the prayers or moving prayers, people start to tear. That's a good thing. That's a good sign for a lot of people. It means you're being judged at that moment. The Baal, the Baal Shem Tov says that. That when you're crying, if you start crying, you're being judged at that moment on Rosh Hashanah. So it's very important to cry because crying shows that you care and it's real and it's sincere teshuva. It's not the fake one. It's the real one. It's not the Shem, right? That shouldn't have to act it. It just comes out naturally. Shem should bless all you guys again with a beautiful year of good health, happiness, parnasa, shalom bayit, children that grow up in the path of Torah, Mitzvot, and good deeds, have nachas from all your children. Bezrat Hashem, we should all be zoche for the coming of Mashiach that's destined to happen. If it's not tonight, Bezrat Hashem, it'll be at the end of this now coming Rosh Hashanah. This new year should be the year of Mashiach and Bezrat Hashem, we can all now focus on being close to Hashem all the time. Have a wonderful night for those that are in my Zoom group. Stick around for a couple minutes and we'll schmooze a little bit. I was taught to search for better days. I was taught there was always good. And when my better days turned into a grace, I did the best that I could. Uh, I could take you to the place that you don't know In the place where you cry but you won't oh, When you look into the mirror you won't perfect Mad at yourself cause you know you feel worthless Don't feel alone in a crazy generation Though your love's a light like no hesitation Save from the storm by my daily meditations And I'm wishing for some better days Hey, hey And I'm wishing for some better days Hey, hey And I'm wishing for some better days Here's another one who wants to be perfect But she won't, she gave up, it's not worth it That's why you ran around the country with your backpack Searching for yourself, but you got caught in the rap pack Those were my words, 30 years in the future In the meantime, you're looking for a tutor Noise gets too loud in your head, you're just muter Stress in your life, that you know you gotta lose her Hey, hey Don't get older Happy Nachman once said can start all Take it so lightly I wanna be their friend But they hate and they fight me Every single time I try to fit It was tight See I'm living with the devil So deep and inside me I need some help Cause they just call me loco So I took his head and put it in a chokehold Never will I give up Even though that was a dream yo Oh my god that was a dream yo Hey, hey.